my dear friends, my brothers and sisters, I greet you in the name of our precious God and Savior. I felt very impressed today to talk to you about God's faithfulness and share my life testimony. Psalm 121, I read from New Revised Standard Version. I lift my eyes to the mountains from where my help will come. My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. He who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun will not strike you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. The Lord will keep your going out and coming in from this time and forevermore. Let us pray. Our dear Lord, your love and your guidance in, in our lives is incredible. Your faithfulness is far beyond of any our attempt to show our loyalty to you. Your mercy never ends. Please speak to us through your spirit. We plead you in your precious name. Amen. In a time of uncertainty and disaster, time when future seems to be unclear and past to choose is in a fog, times like this, Bible authors were impressed to look back and reflect on the road God led his people. God, who is the creator, who is the sustainer of universe and protector of our lives. John, the beloved disciple, in his very old age, had to respond to the major challenges Christians of second generation had to maintain the faith. When all eyewitnesses were long dead and there was nobody personally to relate to, they didn't know how to keep the faith and how and what to base their faith on. Instead of debating of Christ's nature, John writes his gospel, sequences of stories from his own life with Christ. And the book, he started not where he met Christ, but from very beginning. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. He's showing his audience that Jesus, not through physical touch, but through, through his word, can touch us. He can be near us and he can guide us through his spirit. Paul, as well, after his drastic conversion, being completely crushed and sidetracked from what he thought is faithfulness to God, went to Arabia for three years. What he was doing there? We read about in Galatians chapter 1, verse 17 and 18. Nor did I go to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me, but I went to Arabia and returned once more to Damascus. Then, after three years, I went up to Jerusalem. Saul certainly didn't go to Arabia in order to evangelize. He needed a major break to stop and to reflect who he is and who Christ is. The place he went to is Mount Sinai. He goes back to the beginning, back to the source of his commission, back where everything for Jewish nation started. They, for three long years, he's studying and praying 
to rediscover a new God who met him on the road to Damascus. God who is faithfully leads his people. There, by the foot of the mountain, after this time, Saul is to become a biggest messenger of God's loyalty. Ellen G. White, in her book, Last Day Events, page 72, writes, We have nothing to fear for the future, except we shall forget the way God led us and his teaching in our past. Reflecting on this fact, I felt compelled to share with you my personal testimony of God's miraculous interventions in my life, story of my conversion and my building up in Christ. Please bear with my English and forgive me my accent. I have been born in Russia. In communism times, in very ordinary Russian family. About my birth, my mom tells me I was tiny, seven month old, premature baby. When in small town, when I was born, was no equipment to care for such ones. Doctors told my parents rather not to give me any name because soon they will lose me. I spent my first two months in the hospital alone. Once in the middle of the night, nurse on duty felt impressed to come to my bed and found me breathless and blue. She took me to ICU and I came back to life again. What if she would come a little bit later or just not respond to God's voice? It was beginning of God's miracles in my life. Growing in a country where communism for 70 years replaced Christianity, as a child, I remember pictures of Lenin everywhere you would possibly enter. Offices, school, town halls. If I watch my kindergarten pictures everywhere, Lenin on background as requirements for any social activity. When you sit in a class in school, you face not tables of multiplication, but a frame picture of Lenin. I was honored as a top learner with dedication to little octobrists. It's a primary school organization where children were taught Lenin's life, good deeds, and community service. As a member, you ought to wear a badge with a picture of Lenin child. Later, I became a pioneer, middle school organization, to prepare you for communism party. As a young child, I had to give pledge to be faithful to the teaching of young pioneers. I remember a huge town hall full of people for such occasion and it leaves a huge impression on a child's mind for the rest of his life. You wear a red handkerchief around your neck every day to school. If you lost one or even crinkled one, you will be sent back home. You participate in all pioneers activities, march, and learn pioneer songs. Everything was fine and seems to be right, but the better you're trying to perform and to be good, the more questions like, what is the purpose of all of that? Why I'm doing that all and why this is the right way? What is the reward for that if we all die? And how to deal with contradiction 
powers inside of me. There were no answers communism could give to that. Fear of death, unanswered questions were driving me to depression. My teenager freedom turned into cage by communism mentality prison. I was struggling and searching for meaning in life, but no one could give it to me. Once I even dared to ask my mom if God does exist. She was very abrupt and said, no, and never, ever ask me about it. That was beginning and the end of my religious education at home. By God, but God came to my rescue. Everything started in 1989, when in my small town where I was born, Adventists came to conduct Bible studies. Communism became quite weak by then officially, but it takes generations in order to change mentality in the hearts and minds. People were in search for spiritual truth and crowds and crowds were filling up the town halls to, li to listen to the magicians, spiritualists, evangelists. People didn't care who it is. They were swallowing everything. For all 17 years, communism was holding them back from what they were looking for. I also went for a couple of these meetings and I was stunned because it was something that I couldn't un understand, something beyond comprehension, something unreal was happening. I remember the whole country of Russia in front of television sets to watch the magician who is charging their creams and water and food in front of the TV that they could heal and get better. They were doing funny movements, shaking hands, speaking in tongues. That was interesting times. Among all of that mess, some other type of posters appeared in town. Bible studies conducted by seminary students. I was 12 by then. I would never go for Bible studies. It sounded so foreign to me. If not my friend, classmates, who insisted I should go with him. He already started his uh, spiritual journey as Adventist, but kept everything in secret. Once he even brought a book, Steps to Christ, in Russian to school and showed it to me under the school table so not, nobody could see. On the cover page was a picture of Jesus holding the earth. You probably know that picture. I never saw something like that. I liked the picture and I took the book home to read, but language was far beyond of my comprehension. He said, I should rather go with him to Bible studies. Just because of him, I went. I remember on the first meeting, pastor talking about beasts from Revelation and Daniel, which was far beyond my teenager mind. Except I was only child among very old ladies. I never planned to stay. But a little bit of attention every time made me to come back. I remember I got a booklet from pastor and with his hand he wrote on it, I'm praying for you. What? Are you praying for me? 
what is the prayer. I had no clue. But I understood pastor does care. Another time, greeting me by the entrance, he said, welcome. He is your future. What do you mean future? He among the old ladies who long time retired and have nothing to do. I didn't understand. But he was right. He was prophesying. There my future started. My future with God. Bible studying changed into Sabbath meetings. I was still coming. Adventists found a room to rent where so-called in those day video salons were been running. I remember sitting in a movie chair with the posters of horror heroes at the back and, T and Jesus stretching his hands to you in front. It was weird. But I was found something among the strange bunch of believers, a very particular feature I was attracted to. They did care. I liked the songs they were singing the most. It was late autumn time, and if you look at the window, sky is gloomy and grey, rain, 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 and again rain. Cold makes you think about something pessimistic. And that song, that melodious song of Christ's life and warmness, it just didn't fit the entire picture. And I remember when I looked again into the window, suddenly everything changed in a moment. Picture was still the same, but not the same. Light was everywhere. It, through, it, it shines through straight into me and bring me, brought me hope and meaning. I couldn't recognize the things. I wanted to sing along. I was changed. It was my conversion. Since then, many milestones had to pass still in my development with God and getting to know Him. I didn't know too much about Bible. We never saw it as the children, and it was impossible to find it anywhere. I remember someone illegally buying it from the bookshop keeper and what the precautions they had to go to. Adventists brought us Bibles. Little I could understand reading it, but slowly, drop by drop of colors were added to my palitra of God's character. It was amazing. Adventists had a, such a logical, holistic and meaningful Bible worldview where things are making sense, where events are fitting to each other and doctrines are thoroughly grounded in scripture and it attracted me. And even if I had questions and if I would bear a little bit and wait, I would find that missing puzzle and place it in the right place to make even bigger picture, clear picture to me. I just had to faithfully wait and study. I remember one Sabbath pastor was talking about prayer. I never prayed before. Never I knew what is that neither. I made a decision to try it coming night. I remember waking up in the middle of the night so nobody could notice me. Kneeling down to my bed. I didn't know what to say and trembling inside of me, I could only whisper, God, I know you do exist. 
and the tears ran down my cheeks. It was my first prayer. My parents noticed that something that they thought it would be educational to me turned to be more, turned to be meaning and joy of my life. They objected my visits to Adventists. The town was too small and bad rumors started to spread quickly. They didn't want me neither to be associated with these people nor to be involved in a very dangerous, as they thought, strange American sect, which religion has nothing to do with orthodox teaching. Sabbath teaching particularly was in complete contrast with the Russian lifestyle. As you know, the weather is severe, the winters along up to 25 Celsius minus. For South Africans, I used to say the winter is your, the summer is your winter. And another six months are very cold and another three you will not survive. The weather allows you to plant and harvest only three months in summer. Everybody in town would have a plot of land outside the town where you would go for a weekend to work on and plant your vegetables. Potatoes as staple food, tomatoes, paper, greens, berries and preserve it for winter later. Russians would store it in the rooms, in the cool rooms and it will feed the families throughout the rest of the year. If you don't do it, you will be without food for the rest of the year. Middle class worker family financially not able to afford to buy fresh vegetables and greens. And it's not available in the shops anyway. So everyone had to provide food for themselves and maybe sell some in order to produce of the produce to make money. Every weekend is counted. If you miss one, weather will not allow you to catch up. You're gonna miss in harvesting and be hungry for the rest of your year. So you could understand the situation. I'm the older sister. I supposed to help my parents to look after my younger brother and to be number one who helps in the garden making preserves, drying fruits, making jams. So out of two days we have as a family to work in the garden, I'm claiming one to spend with a bunch of lazy heads singing songs. What a nonsense. It's absolutely not acceptable for my parents. And then the food topic. My grandparents supplied my family with pork meat for the year. Any meal on the table had pork in it or pork's fat. It was very difficult years of my life. Attitude of my parents toward me changed completely. They tried their best to break my stubbornness in foreign teaching. They would lock me in made me down in front of my friends and my brother. It was very hard to me to feel that absolute need for parental guidance and love and to go against their will and orders. I also used to be very obedient daughter. Now I'm doing what the sect is telling me to do. I understood my parents, they're raising up in a completely atheist country with no thought about God. And now when they're proud and joy, their older daughter does it to them. I had to choose to obey my parents or to obey God. That split my family apart. Sneaking out of the house for youth or prayer meeting, Sabbath worship, I was full of fear what to expect back at home. 
Anglet. It is long in the past. Secretly, I was baptized. I was 12. I remember in the committee for the baptism candidates, they asked me what I think about fifth commandment. They hit the hardest point. I will never forget that summer day on a river when 10 of us youngsters were baptized. I had a picture printed as my treasure. In these days, published Adventist books were rarity. I would buy them secretly on my pocket money, saving my pocket money and hide them somewhere at home so my parents would not find it. But one day, they did find it. I remember I came home from church and I found my mom crying on a heap of Baptists' pictures. My books torn into small pieces, discs. Do you remember these plastic big discs? Broken in half. Drama. That was a big drama. It is hard for me even in memory to return back to these days. And it was still a long road of hardships for me to go. I was in matric. I supposed to go to university. The payments to compare with these days, you're supposed to sell the flat in order to pay your child at, uh, university fees. And my parents did. It was very hard for them financially and laid even harder burdens on my shoulders. Universities were six-day scheduled study. How will I be able to go through five years missing all the classes on Sabbath? I didn't know the answer. I would not even try to think about it. I simply had to trust God. Every Sabbath was full of classes. It was mainly practicums. I was studying languages. And if you're missing discussion or oral exercises on Sabbath, nobody will be able to give you recordings. We didn't have devices that time or textbooks or notes. You come on Monday back and you are not prepared, completely not prepared. Moreover, you didn't do the homework and you don't know material. I hardly was passing my tests. Exams were falling mainly on Sabbath. It was very difficult for me to make arrangements with professors who are military atheists. But God was keeping me there. I could tell miracle by miracle every Sabbath of my keeping. And every exam I had to go to or fail. I didn't have a good reputation among my classmates, mainly of the Sabbath story. Secondly, I didn't participate in their socials and parties. I would have my church uh, socialize with and young people to spend time with. I remember not pitching up for exams and again and again and my classmates would exclaim, you dig yourself a ditch, girl. Yes, I did. And she was right. But God got me out of it. The third year was a particularly challenging year. I had to pass my state comprehensive exams in every subject to be accepted for the next level of master's program. Exams were on Sabbath. The main exams in languages was two. Oral and writings. I tried to speak to the head of committee, but my reasons for them were only to laugh about. I asked my pastor of the church to talk to any member of the committee, and he did, but it made them even more angry and put me even in more difficult situation. 
I personally went to rector of university begging me to allow me to pass exam on any other day. The old man replied me telling a very sad story. His father was a Baptist. He grew up in a family of 10 kids when the First World War broke out. Father refused to take arms and he was put to prison for his faith. Mother left alone to raise 10 kids. In her desperation and poverty, she denied God and faith of her husband and raised children as atheists. Such a man I faced pleading for Sabbath. He didn't make any move toward my requests, left me with the words, it's your choice, your sect or diploma, university diploma. I chose my sect. I didn't come for exams. I was expelled. How to convey news to my parents that would, me, that would chase me out of house. From the stress I was going through, I became very sick. Rector called my parents for a visit. The day they had to drive to see him, our car broke. They couldn't meet. Other appointments also didn't work. I knew God merciful keeps his hand over me. Till today my parents don't know I didn't go to any classes on Sabbath and I was expelled this year for my Sabbath keeping. I had to appear to rector again for my documents. I thought maybe I will find another university where I can continue to study. That day he told me in a week time I can come for my second chance for my missed exam. It was shock to me because I didn't expect it. Summer holidays passed, I didn't study because I didn't know about that option. Exam was combination of languages with practical studies. There's no ways you can prepare for that in one week. Without preparation and with my missing knowledge of Sabbath lectures, feeling very sick, I knew I had a very little chance to pass it. Plus attitude of the entire committee toward me. I asked my church and my friends to pray. And I went. I remember very vividly they gave me to prepare after drawing my ticket. The moment I sit before them, the door of the room opened and the rector walked in. He started a discussion with the members of the committee and they all were focused on him, not paying attention to me. I didn't know should I carry on or should I pause and wait. They asked me to carry on. I knew I'm talking nonsense or rather things out of topic, making many mistakes, but nobody was listening to me. At the moment I finished, they finished discussion too and they turned to me. And they said, we hear you have prepared well for exams and we're giving you a chance to continue your further studies on a second level. I couldn't believe it. They didn't hear me. They didn't hear anything what I said. I rushed to my church friends to tell them the news and what I hear from them, that they were praying, they would close the ears of the committee member, they would not hear me. For the new, I'm not prepared and I'm sick. God literally answered the prayer. God closed the ears of all that people. I remember my graduation day. The same rector was standing in front of me with diploma. I was wondering what he was thinking about. He couldn't look at me. I went through an institution where no one ever could graduate and be faithful to keep the Sabbath. It was the next victory of God in my life. 
I was 20 years old then. Another 20 till now to go. Still a long story of his miraculous intervention and providence. But I will leave it for the next time. How I became a theology student. My graduation with master degree with no money to pay for the studies about my travels around the world being a missionary, working for the church and ending up living in South Africa, having husband and lovely son, will be another interesting story for me to tell you. Ending up my testimony today and looking back at my pages of life, I witnessed. I was fearful. I was weak. I had mistakes. I didn't know too much Bible as I know today, but I loved God and I wanted to be faithful to Him. And He has proven Himself to be faithful to me. Hope that my testimony will strengthen your faith, your walk and your love to God. For He will never leave you nor forsake you. The one who created heaven and earth will no slumber, no sleep to look after his children. He will ever be on your right hand and he is coming soon in his glory to fetch you, to live with him forever. I lift my eyes to the mountains from where my help will come. My help will come from the Lord who made heaven and earth. O Lord Jesus, come soon. Let's pray. God, faithful Lord and Savior, we want to stay in awe of your faithfulness, of your guidance, of your love, of your protection. You created your children and you care for your children forever. We want to thank you who you are in our lives, who you will be, and that you will make us to heaven, to be forever with you, where you show us even more about yourself and your love and guidance in our lives. Thank you for being such a wonderful and loving God toward us, sinful beings. Amen.